Welcome to Life Study of the Bible with Witness Lee, a program provided by Living Stream Ministry. Witness Lee emphasized the experience of Christ as life and the practical oneness of the believers. He was unbending in his conviction that God's goal is not narrow sectarianism, but the body of Christ. Through his messages in these life studies, he stressed the importance for us to grow in life and to function as Christians so that the body can build itself up. We're happy to bring you recorded portions from his ministry today, along with some of our own thoughts. And we welcome your comments and questions. You can reach us toll free at 888 Study. That's 888-543-3788. Now let's join today's program. The history of the kings of Israel and Judah recorded in the books of Kings and Chronicles includes many troubling accounts of corrupt politics, twisted and distorted religion, and even murder between those vying for leadership over the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. As startling as problems of this magnitude may seem among God's people, an honest consideration of the more contemporary history of God's people, that is, us, his New Testament believers, the church, reveals that within the church today, at least in principle, many of these same kinds of problems are still present. But what's most critical for us today is to realize that whether we're talking about that ancient history between the kings of Israel and Judah or leadership among those in the church today, the root cause of many of these things is the same, and that is the ease with which God's people accept and tolerate division. Bob Danker has joined us uh, again, Bob. It seems when we come to almost any chapter here in Kings now, it's a sober word, isn't it? Yes. uh, These books of Kings and Chronicles contain many, many cases of the kings of Israel and Judah, and nearly every one of them is a sobering revelation or enlightenment to us with a warning that we would not follow in their footsteps. And uh, this matter of division, which you mentioned, we just cannot uh, overestimate how much damage division has caused to God's people over now many centuries. We see it in the Old Testament time and time again among the people of Israel. Yeah. And then in the New Testament, the history of the church is a history of division. And we really need the Lord's mercy. Our feeling toward division would match his. Uh, of course, he really doesn't have any tolerance for this matter of division. That's a very good point. As you were speaking, I was considering how many pulpits is coming uh, Lord's Day morning will be occupied by ministers and preachers and pastors, well-intentioned, who love their flock and doing their best uh, before the Lord to care for them. And they will touch all manners of sins of the flesh that uh, God's people need to be alerted to and on guard and watching. But I wonder how few will touch this matter of division and unchecked ambition. And uh, in the New Testament writings, for sure, I'm thinking of Paul in in Corinthians, it's clear that this is in the same category as all of those other kinds of uh, sins and failures of the flesh, isn't it? Absolutely, Chris. Ambition with uh, the product of ambition, which is division and confusion and other negative things among God's people, is really something of the flesh, which we need to recognize, we need to condemn, and we need to really repudiate so that the Lord can have a way to build up his body on this earth. Specifically today, Bob, we're going to be talking about a couple of chapters in 2 Kings 11 and 12. And uh, these really indicate the situation that existed. And we just see all kinds of examples and and stories of the corruption and how evil it had become. It begins with a very interesting verse in 11.1. Of course, we just had the death of one of the kings of Judah, and that was the king Ahaziah. And we begin now hearing about his mother, whose name is Athaliah. Verse 1, it says, Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she rose up and destroyed all the royal seed. What possible motive might we have here, Bob? Well, I think it's pretty clear, Chris. (laughs) Athaliah was an ambitious woman. She intended, and she did, usurp the throne of Judah. Actually, one of the royal seed, one of the sons, uh, should have been the next in line after his father. But here, Athaliah rose up, killed the royal seed, except for one, We realize uh, he was preserved, he was spared, he was one year old, I think, at that time. And then she usurped the throne. 
And I think the motive is fairly clear, and that is just ambition to rise up, to be above others, to have a position that really was not given to her by God. So for a number of years, she actually then did rule over the house of Judah. And we're talking about she was trying to commit murder, exterminate her own grandchildren, who would, would be the ones in succession, the proper succession there, all because of her own unchecked ambition. This was really an evil thing, for sure. Well, we have to be uh, reminded that the backdrop of all of this is that there has already now taken place this uh, cataclysmic division among God's people, and two kingships, in a sense, two kingdoms have replaced the one in Israel. There's now the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And so against this now violation of the principle of the oneness of God's people, we see all of these evils just come flowing forth in just a torrent of compounding evil, don't we? That's right. This great evil that came in among God's people, Israel, was the evil of division. And that became the root of many, many other kinds of evils. Here we see murder, usurping authority, which was not God-given. Right. All kinds of evil came out of this one evil of division. I think to underscore the point that we want to make today and that this is not a problem that is confined to the pages of the Old Testament, let's take a New Testament example, and it happens to involve another mother in uh, Matthew chapter 20, uh, verses 20 and 21. It says, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, who would be the apostles John and James, or the disciples at that time, John and James, came to him, meaning the Lord, with her sons, worshiping and asking something of him. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine will sit one on your right and one on your left in your kingdom. And of course, as we will hear Witness Lee describe today, this was not the only occasion where there was a kind of a seeking after the preferred position among the disciples, was it? That's right. This is quite a a situation here. Uh, The disciples here just did not understand what uh, God's way to bring in his kingdom and to fulfill his purpose. And they were here seeking something just of their own human interest, their own human ambition. This was a real frustration to the Lord. I think if we open today, Bob, uh, there's a lot of light here uh, in the word we're about to hear today. Let's join Witness Lee. In reading the history of the kings, the main thing you could see is division. Now, we have to ask, from where division comes, the only answer is ambition. Division comes out of people's ambition, desiring to be something higher than others, to be the head, the ruler, and the king of the people. Ambition. In the New Testament teaching, the oneness of the body of Christ is very much stressed. Firstly, you know, when the Lord Jesus was on this earth, not too many followed him. According to the four Gospels, the record tells us those followers of Jesus, they all loved the Lord Jesus to the uttermost, even before the Spirit came. But they loved the Lord. By giving up their country, their home, their relatives, to follow the Lord for that many years, three and a half. But in that period of time, the most tragic thing among them is the uh, matter. Who is going to be great? They stress for the greatness. Even one day, a mother who was a relative in the flesh to the Lord Jesus, brought her two sons to ask the Lord, Lord, when you get the kingdom, please put my two sons, one on your right and the other on your left. Even until the last trip the Lord took to go to Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus told them, now I'm going to Jerusalem. I will be crucified at least two or three times. The Lord told them he was going to die. They did 
would love the Lord. We all would believe when they heard such a bad news, they would lose their heart in every way. But rather, they didn't pay attention to that. Yet, they were quarreling on the way. Who is going to be great? Uh, Bob, a couple of things here maybe you could touch. I remember recently doing a kind of a Bible study. I went back and looked up all these references where the Lord, in those final days when he was coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, taking the opportunity to mention to his disciples clearly what was about to come to him in Jerusalem. That is, of course, he was prophesying of his uh, crucifixion. And there's no evidence that they had any awareness of it. The disciples were just completely occupied with something else. And so he even repeated it three times. The reason they didn't hear it, they were preoccupied with this matter. And the matter that they were preoccupied with was this ambition. If you could touch that and also the relationship or the linkage between ambition and division. Yes, Chris. Ambition is a kind of a plague, I would say. It came into the human race at the time of the fall. Actually, the first one who was ambitious was Satan who was the archangel created by God. He had a very high position in the universe that was given to him by God. But if we read Isaiah 14, we can see that he wanted to exalt himself to be on the same level as God himself. This is a the seed of ambition. And ever since man fell, this ugly thing has existed in the flesh of every fallen man. And that includes us. We have to admit, we have this desire within us to rise above others, to be higher than they are, to rule over others, to tell people what to do, and so forth. You know, this is just part of the fallen nature of man. Mm -hmm. Man is occupied with elevating himself to a higher position. But if we compare the disciples here with the Lord Jesus, he told them that he was going into Jerusalem not to be crowned as the king, but to be despised, rejected, and put on a cross, crucified, and then he would rise up. This was the Lord's carrying out the Father's will to accomplish the economy of God. How different the Lord Jesus was from those two uh, disciples of his and their mother, and I would say how different from us. We have to say, oh, the Lord is too wonderful. He is in another category from all the rest of the human race. This is why we need to love him and embrace him, because uh, he is the unique one in the universe who is one with God and does the will of God and doesn't care for himself or his own interests. So on the one hand, he is uh, pointing out to them all of this time that he is not going to assume a lofty position, but he actually was going to suffer and to be at the bottom and not make himself on the top is a kind of a pattern to them. They missed it completely until after the Lord, of course, was crucified and resurrected and came back to them. Then in his final hours, the prayer that he utters in John 17, which we'll get into in this next section, really underscores what he's actually trying to convey, doesn't it? That's right. The Lord prayed for the oneness among all his believers. All right, let's go back to Witness Lee on this important portion. In the last night of the Lord's life on this earth, the Lord gave him a long speaking. That long speaking covers... John chapter 14, 15, 16. Then at the end, the Lord gave a concluding prayer. That is John chapter 17. In that prayer, the Lord stressed repeatedly, Father, keep them all in oneness. Keep them all one as you and I weigh the triune God our one. The Lord trust to the uttermost because the Lord prayed based upon the fact that one day these my disciples will have our life in them and they will call you the Father. They will have your name known by them and then they will realize that what the Lord Jesus spoke to them 
were truths. And the truths will be reminded to them by the Spirit. Not only so, they will realize that they will be in the glory which you have given me. Oh, the life of the Triune God, the name of the Father, the truths concerning God, the economy, and the glory. Based upon these four basic things, the Lord prayed for them. They remained in their faith until they got to know the Lord resurrected. They prayed together in one accord for ten days. Then the Pentecost came and their Lord was put out in another form. That is, in the form of the outpoured spirit. Then the church had began. That was wonderful. But gradually, division came in. Bob, this prayer, we just heard him talking about, that we referenced as we began that section in John 17, verse 11. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given to me, that they may be one, even as we are. Uh, If you go to verse 22, and the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are. It's amazing, isn't it? He's talking about a kind of a oneness here that far exceeds and surpasses uh, our human cooperation and agreement, doesn't it? That's right, Chris. This is the highest oneness in the universe, and it is actually the oneness that is in the triune God himself. You know, among the three of the Trinity, we have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. These three are absolutely one. There is a oneness among these three that is unknown to us in the human realm. It's something divine. And Witness Lee mentioned here what is the factors of this oneness. That is the divine life, the life of God, the name of the Father. We all have the same divine Father. The truths revealed in the holy word of God concerning his economy and the divine glory. The Lord prayed that we all would enjoy these four wonderful factors, and as a result, that we would be one even as the Father and the Son are one. This is a a oneness that is beyond our imagination. It's something in the triune God, but it is something that we can enjoy in the divine life, in the Spirit, even in God himself. He uh, mentions a New Testament example of what happens when God's people have such a condition of oneness and this genuine oneness pervading them. After the Lord's death and resurrection, of course, we have the account in the book of Acts chapter 1 where these, uh, this small number, relatively small number, 120, uh, they go up into this upper room and there they remain together in a complete one accord and pray for 10 days. And, of course, what happens is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as a result. Uh, But uh, this condition didn't last that long, did it? No, it didn't. Uh, It was a wonderful uh, situation there in Acts chapter 1. But as we read on in the New Testament, we find out that the situation of oneness in one accord didn't last that long. Eventually, some divisions, again, caused by ambitions, came into the church. Well, let's look at uh, one of the negative examples then that follows this positive example, and that is possibly the first case of ambition leading to division that we see in the New Testament pages. Here's Witness Lee once more. According to the New Testament record, the first division that invaded the church came in through Barnabas when he left Paul because Mark as a cousin of Barnabas joined their first trip. On the way, Mark cannot suffer all the troubles for that kind of trip. And Mark retreated. That was a defeat. Now, on the second trip, Barnabas would still take his cousin. Paul would not agree. Because of that, Barnabas left. Paul. 
there was a division. In serving the Lord in the body of Christ, your heart must be single, must be pure. Probably there was at least a little portion of Barnabas' ambition. From that time, division became a problem to the apostles. Of course, nearly all of them endeavored to keep the oneness of the body. But divisions rose up. So, Paul wrote his epistle to the church in Ephesus. In chapter 4, he says, The believer's behavior, conduct, the first virtue, is to keep the oneness of the spirit. That is, to keep the oneness of the body. In reading the history of the kings, you can see, division brought in confusions, brought in murders, brought in the usurping of thrones. These are in the typology. In the fulfillment, in the entire Christian world, nothing but division, confusions, killing, spiritual murder, usurping of thrones. Today's things are the fulfillment of the typology. Bob, the account here in the book of Acts relating uh, to Paul and Barnabas. In chapter 9, it's actually Barnabas that somewhat ushers Paul into the ministry, at least uh, gives a word whereby he's received by all of the other apostles. Uh, And then they're together, we see later on in chapter 13. But by that time, it's Paul who stands up first to speak. But finally, by the time we get to chapter 15, something happens, doesn't it? That's right. Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement over uh, whether to take Mark along with them And Paul did not want to do this, but Barnabas insisted on it, and eventually Barnabas took Mark and sailed away and left Paul. So there was a division. We may ask, well, what is the cause of such a division? Was it just a kind of a disagreement among two servants of the Lord? Was it just that Mark was the cousin of Barnabas and Barnabas was partial toward him? Might have been a factor. Yeah. But there might also have been a little bit of ambition on the part of Barnabas because, as you said in the beginning, he was the leader of these two, Paul and Barnabas. At one time in the book of Acts, you read, it's Barnabas and Paul. But eventually, a time yeah. came when Paul rose up to take the lead. We don't know whether something was touched in Barnabas or not, and he had a reaction at this point. At any rate, we all have to condemn this evil thing of ambition. We all have to realize what a tremendous damage it has done to God's people throughout all the centuries. And we need to keep ourselves in the divine life where the oneness is, in the spirit where the oneness is, in the triune God where the oneness is. As long as we are in ourself, our fallen natural self, we will be ambitious and we will be plagued by this curse of ambition. Yeah, there may not be, um, you know, actual murder going on between those vying for leadership among God's people, but in principle, it goes on all the time, doesn't it? It goes on all the time, Chris. And it's all linked to the same thing that plagued the children of Israel and the kings in those uh, ancient days, and that was this uh, desire, this ambition, and uh, all resulting from division being such a common thing among God's people. Uh, I think we all have a lot to be uh, humbled by and sobered by, and probably uh, repentant of, don't we? Absolutely. Thanks for uh, joining us on a difficult program, Bob, but one I feel like uh, is important that we were able to bring to the listeners today. I agree. This is very important, Chris. Okay, we hope you'll get the printed Life Study messages uh, about uh, this passage, these portions, and the others uh, included in our volume of Life Studies of First and Second Kings. That's one volume for both books. If you'd like to receive that, call us toll-free at one eight 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 life study 888 543 3788. For Bob Danker, I'm Chris Wilde. Thanks so much for listening today. You've been listening to Life Study of the Bible with Witness Lee, produced 
by Living Stream Ministry. Witness Lee ministered the Word of God for over seven decades. Many consider these life studies as his seminal work, an exhaustive commentary on the entire Bible from the perspective of the believer's enjoyment and experience of God's divine life in Christ through the Spirit. If you'd like to find out more about Witness Lee, these life study messages, or any of the materials provided by Living Stream Ministry, please visit our website, lsm.org. That's lsm.org. You can also email us, radio at lsm.org, or call us toll-free, 1-888-LIFE-STUDY. Thanks for listening today. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Follow us on social media or visit our website for more from Living Stream Ministries.